to make the ones that whose property hasn't been taken register themselves and their property so that they're next on the list of confiscations and and expulsions um, that does sound like on, to be honest it sounds like the Holocaust because that's what the Nazis did first off and I'm not trying to say that individual Ethiopians are Nazis but that's they should be aware that that's the way the Nazis started they confiscated property they interned people uh, well they started by making them register the, they made them pariahs in their own community by labeling them as the Jews mm. they encouraged or certainly did not discourage acts of hostility by citizens against these individuals and from what we can tell all that is happening in Ethiopia now and there are perhaps 200,000 ethnic Eritreans who are in considerable danger if the world doesn't wake up. The government of Eritrea continued to press for a peaceful settlement while at the same time defending its sovereignty from Ethiopia's invasions. The Eritrean Defense Forces bravely drove back every attempt by the invading army that came to violate the land's law. That was a senseless war. There was no reason for that war. There was no justification for a war like that. I think the problem is um, there has not been any international, any meaningful international uh, pressure has been brought to bear on, on uh, the TPLF regime. Uh, the international community has, has considerable leverage over, over Ethiopia. Ethiopia is uh, the largest re recipient of, of uh, development assistance from the World Bank and the IMF. It's still the, uh, the largest recipient within the ACP countries of EU development assistance. At the moment, uh, Ethiopia is facing um, a big uh, threat of famine. In the last uh, 10 months, that's from September until October 1998, Ethiopia got something like 520,000 tons of food aid from, from uh, Western donors. There is a fresh appeal for 820,000 tons of food aid. Um, and that's additional to what was uh, supplemented last year. In monetary terms, the figure may not be exact, but Ethiopia has obtained uh, not less than 1.2 billion uh, dollars um, uh, last year alone. So, you know, there is, there is a strong argument, there is a compelling argument for saying that if the international community were, were to apply uh, incremental pressure, or if all these development assistance were to be linked in a very serious uh, way, with progress or with uh, the response of the TPLF regime to peace, it could have had an impact. Meanwhile, Eritrea's desire for peace began to gain international recognition as Eritreans worldwide began staging peace march, calling on the governments of their hosting nations to contribute towards peace by exerting pressure on Ethiopia to stop its atrocities and gross violations of international laws. We believe uh, justice and truth prevail at the end of the day. Whatever the complications we see these days, the question is simple and its solution does not require any uh, more time and energy. It could be resolved technically without uh, any political complication. If there are controversies as to where the border uh, falls on the map or on the ground, we can go for arbitration. There is no complexity in that regard. The very, the very simple thing, one document 
and one agreement will solve the whole problem in no time. Demarcation might not take more than three to six months in my opinion. Arbitration might take some time, but that would make the uh, arrangement more solid and legally binding and uh, relieve future generations from any more complications that might arise from uh, border disputes. After three fruitless attempts, the TPLF regime was left with no choice but to sign the cessation of hostilities and the comprehensive peace agreements in Algiers in June and December 2000, respectively. Following close to 18 months of litigation, the decision of the Boundary Commission was announced in April 2002, heralding, in Eritrea's view, the end of a period of uncertainty and war. Our experience during the last two and a half years clearly demonstrates that the Ethiopian government resorts to misrepresentation, to creating or fabricating facts, to subterfuge, and to bluffing. And in doing so, it's merely trying to obstruct the expeditious implementation of the agreement. Otherwise, the truth is bound to prevail in due course. And the truth did prevail. The legal and peaceful settlement that Eritrea had long called for gradually began to take its final shape with the Eritrean Ethiopian Boundary Commission giving its decision at The Hague on April the 13th, 2002. With specific reference to page 84 of the Boundary Commission's decision on Badume, the Commission observes that the area of claimed administration does not extend in any significant way towards the Ethiopian claim line. Further down on the same page, it states that the Commission does not find in them evidence of administration of the area sufficiently clear in location, substantial in scope, or extensive in time to displace the title of Eritrea that had crystallized as of 1935. All in black and white, the Boundary Commission's ruling indicated that there should be no future dispute over where Badime was located. A legal and peaceful solution, which Eritrea had long called for before this whole catastrophe raged, became the ultimate solution that Ethiopia now had to abide by, all along Eritrea's line of reasoning was that peace cannot be kept by force, it can only be achieved by legal means. It interrupted progress, it slowed progress, it obstructed a number of uh, our programs. A lot of destruction happened and much of the infrastructure we built was destroyed by the war. We had to go again and rebuild that. But again, I can say, uh, despite the challenge of the war, we've been uh, determined more to uh, achieve our goals even during the, 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 the war time. When the Boundary Commission gave its rulings on the border issue, the message for Eritrea from a landmark deemed to be the beginning of the end to the conflict was that it was time to move on back again with programs of national development hindered by four years of war. development programs began moving forward at full speed ahead. Members of Eritrea's defense forces who safeguarded the country's integrity from the TPLF aggression became the vital source of a country that always exhibited pride in its human resources who will selflessly carry through a vision of building a modern nation. One of the things that I want to uh, stress for people is they need to come here. Mm -hmm. They need to come here and they need to see the developments on their own. Uh, there's many, many, many projects that they can participate in. And uh, the diaspora is not left out in this mm -hmm. program. There's a lot for us to do. We just haven't been able to identify it and find out where, where we best fit in. 
So if you came here, if any Eritrean came here, they could find something that they could do to contribute mm. and be a part of. I would hate for any Eritrean, including myself, to live for the next 20 years and not have participated in this development mm -hmm. program. Um, for the Warsai and Ikalo, I cannot imagine the pride that they're feeling. Because uh, to be able to do this for your country, it's got to be the greatest uh, wonderful feeling and we, we, didn't, we didn't get a chance to do that. Uh, fighting for independence, the struggle, you know, the soldiering, you know, all mm -hmm. that stuff is, yes, it's got its uh, good, good points and it's got its good place in history mm -hmm. and it belongs in history, but we are here and we have a country now. And to be able to develop this country and be able to tell your kids and grandchildren, you know, I did this, you know, you know the road that you're traveling on was not built by some mm -hmm. uh, outsiders mm -hmm. or something. This was built by Eritreans. Mm -hmm. Eritrean ingenuity, Eritrean expertise, Engineering. Eritrean know-how, uh -huh. engineering, <laughs> technical know-how, hands-on, you know. It's just the most the wonderful thing to, to really experience. And I don't know that uh, too many African countries or any other countries can mm -hmm. really have or, or brag about the stuff like that. And we have a lot to be proud of. We really do. We have a lot of work. And I feel like uh, we're, not a, we're not a small country. It's a big country. It's mm -hmm. a big country that uh, requires tremendous work. And a lot of work is being done here. We don't know anything about the work that's being done here. And the only way you're going to know about it is if you come here. The people are not going to stop to tell you about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the best thing to do is to come here and see for yourself. Eritrea had already closed the chapter on the four years of unjustified war by the Ethiopian regime. It wanted to move on with programs of national development and economic rehabilitation. The regime in Ethiopia, on the other hand, failed to comprehend that signing the Algiers Agreement had meant the core of the decision would read as final means binding and binding final. The regime in Ethiopia is a minority regime which has defied every logic. As you clearly put it, the commission was set up and the commission clearly spelled out saying the f this is final and binding. I think people should realize the exercise that the two governments went through. First negotiation was tried failed. Second, there was an attempt to overthrow the government of Eritrea, even to occupy, reoccupy Eritrea. So a massive military uh, activity was launched against Eritrea by the regime in Addis, which is a minority regime, with, with all its fanfares and uh, with all its uh, uh, kind of deceptions and lies of, uh, to the Ethiopian people, as if, you know, uh, that war was essential. So the third stage was the legal proceedings. Mm -hmm. In any border conflict, any border can be only resolved through legally. No matter how much you march, even if we march to Addis, they would have told us, okay, now you go and demarcate. Even if they march you know, to Asmara, they would have told them, go and demarcate legally. Mm -hmm. So the third stage was uh, the one, the, the legal stage, which should have taken place initially I'm not going to dwell on that because everybody knows it was strictly the, the regime in Ethiopia under the pretext of a border conflict was trying to, to pretend as if there are more Ethiopians than, than the Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. So it was a more or less a cover that was a, a pretext for launching a re-annexing Eritrea. So that, that we leave for historians to deal. Mm -hmm. But in our case, in, uh, in our Ethiopian Eritrean border case, it was final and binding, which means clearly no appeal, no revision. The maximum they gave us was that we can ask clarification. Mm -hmm. But the Ethiopians presented a document, the, the regime, the minority regime in Ethiopia presented a document even to the commission saying that uh, we need a uh, 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 they said uh, correction, uh, ob uh, observation, and uh, the term they used no, was not even a, even a, a clarification mm -hmm. on the documents. But the commission 
spelled it clearly to them you cannot revise this thing you cannot reappeal and that's a dead mm -hmm. issue so they they went through all the kind of games you know they say well we have accepted the verdict mm -hmm. but they put and say we are asking them to change mm -hmm. i think what i can only say is that is insulting the international community's intelligence mm -hmm. in particular it's insulting the intelligence of the ethiopian people because in any court proceeding, final and binding is final. You don't appeal, no matter what. The regime which had unleashed the unjustified war in the first place continued to concoct endless obstructions to impede the demarcation process and reverse the boundary decision that it had publicly accepted as final and binding. <laughs> Hey, my eyes are burning.